Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1013. YouTube receives a valid notification of alleged copyright infringement from a copyright holder for one of your videos, the video will be removed in accordance with the law. You'll be notified via email and in your account. And you'll get a strike. If YouTube finds you're a repeat offender, you'll get banned for life. Ah, I say go, 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 go! Like you didn't know this is frame rate, but you might not have known it was episode 145. I'm Tom Merritt. Dude, I didn't even know it was 145, and I'm Brian Brushwood, co-host of Frame Rate, along with Tom Merritt. Hey, and, uh, and that's Brian Brushwood, and we are the folks who really would like you to be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want, and this is the show where we go over all the news and all the things and all the ways that you can make that happen in this technological world in which we live. Tom, Tom, I don't know if you know this, but, like, apparently there's obstacles. There's, like, we want you to watch what you want, when you want, however you want it. But there are people who don't want that. And they, like, make rules in business. Did you even know about this? I did, and it's called The Big Story. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story. Sadly, <laughs> when I first saw this big story, I thought, hmm, another one. Uh, this is a, a video that has been taken down because of a copyright dispute. It was a, a Wild Game Studio review. It was a review of the Wild Game Studio game, Day One, Gary's Incident. Uh, it was by, I don't want to say his name wrong, Cynical Brit, but what was the biscuit? Uh, Total Biscuit. Yeah, Total, Total biscuit. biscuit. Thank you. Yeah, Total is, biscuit. is the account name. And he had done a critical review, basically trashing the video, and it got removed. Well, okay, he had video game footage. And from, from forever, there have been all kinds of random takedowns of videos because of video game footage. But he makes a pretty compelling case in the video that he posted up on his YouTube channel that uh, Wild Games has allowed pretty much every other review of the video game to remain on YouTube. They have only filed a copyright violation against his very critical review. Now, to, re to, to review for those who don't already know this, and apologies to those who do, YouTube follows the United States Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the following way. They say, we're going to run a robot called Content ID, and it's going to go look at all the videos on YouTube, and when it finds one that matches the copyrighted material filed by one of our partners, we're going to send a note to that partner, and they can choose to flag it they can choose to make money off of it, or they can choose to block it. Uh, in this case, what Wild Games did was they saw the video from Total Biscuit and they chose to block it. Now, what Wild Biscuit can do is dispute that, say, no, 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 they're wrong. That's a mistake. Content ID shouldn't have flagged that, so we're going to dispute it. And the video goes back up immediately. If, however, the blocker says, no, 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 we disagree. Then they file an actual digital millennium copyright violation takedown notice to YouTube. YouTube pulls the video down and you can either leave it down and you have a strike against your account. And that's what we heard at the top of the show, three strikes and you're banned for life. Or you can file a legal counter notice. And at that point, the, the takedown notice issuer can either let it go and say, all right, YouTube will take 10 days before they put it up, no matter what happens, or they can take you to court and try to prove and in court that you were not, in fact, within your rights to post the video. 
And that's the biggest thing is at that point, if you decide to escalate to that level, it's sort of out of the hands of YouTube. It's no longer their fight. Now you are for reals committing to duke it out in the actual court of law, you know, where they they can sue you. you and uh, that can be, of course, very time consuming, very expensive. It's a step that virtually nobody on YouTube wants to engage in unless you're YouTube itself up against Viacom. Uh, the uh, the specific thing, the, the challenge on this was that, uh, and you see in this video, by the way, this video got posted, I believe, uh, uh, 48 hours ago. So I guess yesterday morning. And it's already up to 1.3 million views. He makes the case that this is not even an issue of traditional copyright claims because there's remix artists who, you know, uh, you know, who owns a sample of these three notes on a saxophone or whatever. He says, I'm outside of all of that because I wrote them. And he actually shows in this video the actual email. He says, hello, you know, we, we do video reviews of video games. We'd love to do one. Would you mind sending us a key so that we can make a YouTube video about it? And he says, yes, here's the key. So already there's an expectation that this video is going to be uh, made, that it's going to be monetized. Uh, and then he puts it out. It's, of course, highly critical. And then after the fact, uh, this guy takes it down. Uh, the, uh, Stefan, the guy's name is. He uh, from, from uh, what, what was the name of it again? Wild, Wild Games. Wild about, yeah, why, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then he goes on uh, to the Steam forums where somebody asked, why did you take it down? And he says, uh, they have no right to monetize uh, our content. And of course, what he's talking about is, you know, while he's reviewing the game and discussing it, you of course see footage of the game, which is what you've seen on every video game review of anything ever. And if anything is is completely covered by fair use, it is it is criticism. That is the lifeblood. It is the reason we have a First Amendment is so that in a public forum, you could criticize uh, somebody else's content. And of course, in order to do that, you need to be able to uh, to illustrate your points using the other person's media. Uh, and then also uh, he digs up a bunch of emails and exchanges online where the guy, uh, Stefan, explicitly says, yeah, go ahead, make a YouTube about our video. And then breaks down, as you mentioned, Tom, all of the other people who are already monetizing it, but him being the loudest, most critical, most popular one on there was the one where this this whole system got abused. And it's weird because on the one hand, this one video is a massive, massive slap in the face of the video game manufacturer who, uh, by according to Total Biscuit, is using a number of underhanded tech, uh, methods to, to astroturf their stuff, including contributing to their own Kickstarter and getting a bunch of people to give it a 10 on Metacritic so that it would have an unlikely score of 100%. Uh, it, so it's already, like, in the PR war, this is a massive win for the cynical Brit, and it's a massive loss for the company that's doing all this. But I really, it really struck me. I, I don't know how I feel about YouTube's copyright system because, on the one hand, I like that they're building up an ecosystem outside of the legal system. You know, this this sort of gentleman's rules take down. What do you want to do? Can we all shake hands and get this content out there? I like that. But on the other hand, it's obvious that it's very easy to abuse if you have a little bit of power. Like, did, did this affect you at all in that regard? Well, I have been at the mercy of this. Tech News Today, when we covered the first mega upload video, had our show removed and we disputed it and it was and they filed a takedown notice against us and we filed a counter notice and it was going to be 10 days before our daily news show, which was absolutely within its rights and fair use to be showing the video. And it was questionable that Universal, which issued the takedown notice, even owned the video, which was from Mega Upload. Uh, we would have had to wait 10 days. My problem here is that YouTube is only following the law when it comes to the takedown notice part of this, right? And that's the most egregious right. part. The you file a takedown notice. The content ID part is not the law. The content ID part is YouTube trying to make a best effort to help identify infringing content. But the real the real damaging part of this is that takedown notice that says, all right, you say it's infringing, they say it's not, we'll take it down for 10 days and then you guys work it out in court. There, that's just the way this works. Now, one thing that bothers me is he gets into all this stuff about Kickstarter and slamming wild games, and that may or may not be true, but it kind of fudges the issue. And he takes YouTube to task and says, YouTube, you should do more about this. But the problem is YouTube has to follow the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. What wild, uh, what Total Biscuit should be focusing on here is changing the law so that YouTube could make it easier to have fair use. I think he's right to say, YouTube, you should try to make it easier for people as well, but there's only so much YouTube can do. I think you really need to say like, hey, Google, it'd be great if you help push for a new law. 
that allowed your creators to be able to post fair use video without having to worry that somebody who doesn't like what they're going to say abuses the system. So here's what I think would be interesting. And, and yes, you're right. There is the whole like legal side of thing. I am not very optimistic that the law is going to get changed anytime soon. I think there's a tremendous amount of precedent. I think it's going to be a very long, nasty slog until we see any kind of reform in that regard. I would, however, like to see a lot of YouTube's policies simplified. For example, the fact that the way things have to go is, is he puts up the video that's critical of this game. Then the other guys say, I see footage of our games, shut it down. And then YouTube actually shuts it down just like that. And the guy's, the guy's video is offline, as you experienced with Tech News Today. And then the guy has to go back and say, no, this is fair use for these reasons. But that's in the order law, to escalate right? it. Uh, for no, 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 YouTube no, no. to maintain safe harbor, hmm. that's the way they have to do it. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about an actual DMCA takedown. DMCA takedown is the next level that they do. That's the back and forth. You know, first, the infringing thing is there. The, whoever thinks they own it get to say, take it down. Then somebody gets to respond because that's what I'm going through with my, my skeptical lecture, Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural, which has a, you know, like a 50-second like a, a, a clip of, of something from South Park that explains a point I'm trying to make. Uh, so so they, they, they got flagged, got taken down immediately. It was up to be to say, no, it's fair use. Now the ball's in their court, and they have to, now the next level is the DMCA takedown, right? So it, it occurs to me, like, if this is, if you are in the video games industry, if you host Tech News Today, it's unfair that you miss out on those valuable hours of being fresh with the news because somebody in, automatically takes down your content. And it seems to me like YouTube could very easily add a second layer of policy, like preemptively saying, you know, a checkbox that's saying, I understand that some of the content in this will be will likely flag X, Y, or Z. Uh, I am saying in advance that this is fair use and I will only accept a DMCA takedown in order for this to, to to go anywhere, like it seems to me, if you're in one of those uh, one of those industries, that you should be able to do it. But instead, right now, you have to put it out and see if anybody takes it down, and then fight it afterwards. It seems like you should be able to preemptively strike well, based that, on the nature that, that, of your that content. That first part that you're talking about is meant. Uh, to make it not have any legal ramifications to dispute. It's actually content user friendly uh, because it's not a DMCA notice. It says, this part's say this guy's saying you've got infringing content, so we're going to block it. But if you dispute it, it immediately goes back up with no consequences for you. The DMCA part, as you if you read the EFF guide on this, the EFF says, once you get an actual DMCA notice, now you are legally saying, I challenge you, and you can be, you can be taken to court for that. Uh, right for the for the first blocking thing, that's not a legal part. So I, I think what you're suggesting is a great spin, a great fix for the YouTube process that would say, you know what, I'm waving that that non legal part of this because I know there's something here and I want them to go right after me with the DMCA notice. But you're also getting rid of the buffer. You're also saying once they send a DMCA notice, we're right into legal land immediately, which you may not want to do either. So you should carefully consider that. But again. I, well, I think that's a fine idea. It doesn't fix the underlying problem, which was we have a ridiculous DMCA process in the United States that allows someone fairly without risk to get things taken down that they don't like. Yes. Well, I it's certainly, not supposed to be without no risk because you're supposed to be able to be sued. But the guys who do the takedown notices always have more money and more lawyers than the people who get on the other end of them. Well, I, and it's like I don't see how you're going to change it on the legal side of things. I mean, can well, you, you change the law? Single... You go, you have Congress pass a new law that says the DMCA doesn't work like that. That's how you change yeah, the legal side. But, of but, but but can you name one congressman who's going to be on the side of that? You know, it's like right. all the money's That's in favor why of protecting I'm saying it. he should not... be pushing Google to go and say, "Hey, get some congressmen on our side. Help us to move this and change the legislation." For this, yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying you're wrong that YouTube couldn't like add a little tweak, but it really isn't going to solve the problem because then people are just going to go straight to the DMCA notices, which puts you into legal hot water. It's not yeah, going nope. to change the behavior. I agree, and of course, this is one of those things. Th there's a lot of things I feel like we can affect some kind of change by talking about it here on Frame Rate. Yeah. I don't know that this is one of them. This is one where it's just like, wow, that really sucks, and I don't know that anything's going to change much in the next few years. You know what? I can change. What? The mood of our show with another big story. What? Stop everything. It's another big story. Netflix had a very positive earnings report. Among other things, they now have 31 million subscribers in the United States. That's more subscribers than HBO 
has. I'm sorry. It sounded, uh, Tom. There must be a weird Skype hiccup. Uh, it's it sounded sounded as though you said uh, more subscribers than more than HBO, like like bigger, like more people. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry that that there were there must have been a Skype glitch there because I thought you didn't understand that I said <laughs> that Netflix has 30 million subscribers, which is more than HBO has in the United States. That's freaking huge. And, and what yeah. uh, do you know what the average cost for HBO is? I, I mean, just like a ballpark. Is it like 20 extra bucks well, or 10 yeah, extra I bucks? I what it is. It's, it, well, it's around, I think it's like $12, $15 on DirecTV to get the entire HBO, like 15 channels or whatever they have, uh, which if you think about it is like, well, that just gets me access to HBO Go. Then, yeah, it's not quite double what Netflix costs. I would guess. Yeah, but still, but regardless, man, having those numbers first, especially for being somebody who grew up completely outside of the cable ecosystem, is astounding and astonishing. And I'm sure everybody responded with uh, tempered, measured, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, an upturning of the lips. The stock market went crazy. In fact, CEO <laughs> Reed Hastings in his investor letter said... Despite huge swings in our stock price, which is around $330 right now. By the way, a year ago, it was $55. we have continued to grow our membership every year fairly steadily. We do best to ignore the viol volatility in our stock. The progress we've made over the last 10 years is stunning. We want to make the next 10 years even more remarkable. He's telling the investors, like, just, just, just settle down. Like, stop going from $8 to $330 and back again, okay? We're doing fine. And if you read between the lines, what he's really saying is like, I can't do this anymore. My heart can't take it. I need you to stop with the crazy fluctuations. Just yeah, if you seriously. like it, that's great. Tell a friend. That's all I'm asking. Uh, let's see. Uh, Netflix was trading. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual revenue numbers here. But Orange is the New Black is their most popular original show. In fact, uh, it was actually more popular than House of Cards. It has helped drive their viewership. They did say, though, that exclusives like The Walking Dead are more popular, that that's where they get most of their viewership. So even though they're doing these great original shows, it's still the stuff that they're getting from the traditional broadcasters and cable companies that's driving most of the viewing. Well, and that makes sense because, of course, they're part of a giant outside world, and these are the these are the gateway drugs that will funnel people into the Netflix ecosystem. And Netflix has already released statements before saying that Breaking Bad and, and The Walking Dead, all of these shows that people use Netflix as a catch-up way to, to, to get their back on their feet for are an important part of their whole process. Uh, to be honest, I would be utterly shocked if their originals – did better than those. But again, like look at HBO, you know, HBO has was never when they started their original programming in that we'll say the early 80s, might be late 70s. When they started their original programming, they were never focused on numbers much the way Netflix is. They were focused on buzz and Emmy nominations or I guess pre Emmys, Cable Ace Awards. And uh, and it was a good strategy. And I'm glad to see Netflix is doing the same thing. Yeah. And it, this actually gives HBO a little bargaining chip when they go back to talk to the cable subscribers next time about possibly having some sort of internet-only version of HBO, they can say, look, guys, you can, you're going to have to make this worth our while not to do it because Netflix has got more subscribers than us now, and we really need to fend that off. We, we need to figure that out. Yeah. Let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, our only sponsor for today's show. We love them, Shutterstock. Dot com. At Shutterstock, you can find the perfect image or video for your next creative project, whether it's for a website, a publication, an advertisement, or a book trailer, for instance. Tom, look, uh, you, keep, you keep saying this. You keep saying it's easy to use. Name one example of somebody who wouldn't consider himself a film director, but who has a project that he needs to make look super high quality, and he's able to go to Shutterstock, collect the high quality footage, edit it together, and promote his item or service. Name just one. Name one, and I'll believe you. Me? What? Yeah, I actually, uh, for my book, my novel, Lot Beta, I went to Shutterstock. Little, uh, I did a little Ken Burns on some Shutterstock images, but I also got video that I was able to put together, like full motion vector graphics. I got some, some, some renders. I got some live stock footage, and I, I put it together into a, uh, a little 30-second book trailer just Dude, using Shutterstock. Right, bring, bring up some audio on this. I, 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 we're only seeing the tail end. Perfect. Perfect timing. Good job. Good job, yeah. Ray Goto. What? Great benefits. Our system ensures stability in management and yeah, That's me doing the VO. I don't know if anybody cares about that. But look at the look no, at the No, but, but still, man. It looks super legit. I love it.
That's because and Shutterstock I adds over 12,000 video clips every week. They make sure they're good. They look at every one of them before they add them to the library. And it was, so it was easy. You know what I did is I took the videos that I was finding. I was finding way more than I could possibly use. But I put them all in my a clip box. And then I went back into the clip box and I was able to just go through and go, oh, okay, yeah, that one would fit that part of the narration and that one. And then I just downloaded them. They, they have great pricing. You know, they give you the assets you need, flexible pricing, uh, and put it together in iMovie. Done. Yeah, okay, now how long from sitting down and deciding you are going to rock this to execution were you, thanks to the nice footage over at Shutterstock? About an hour. <laughs> what? That yeah. does not look like an hour long trailer or an hour's worth of trailer. That's amazing, man. I mean, I wrote the script previously while sitting and waiting for my wife to get out of Sephora at the mall. Uh, so I already had that part done. But just like finding the clips and then going into iMovie and putting them together. Yeah, it was about an hour. Right on, man. Well, yeah. dude, well, how can... All right, just, all right fine. You, you did it, Merritt. You answered my question, but how can people support our show while checking they out our friends over at Shutterstock? Should just go over to Shutterstock.com, sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card. Just start an account. Begin looking around at all the great images. Maybe put some in a clip box. Maybe you've got some kind of book trailer or some other video project. Just put that clip box stuff together. And then once you're like, I think I found what I need, and you decide to purchase, use offer code FRAMERATE1013. And new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com. For 25% off new accounts, use offer code FRAMERATE1013. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of FRAMERATE. Slipstream me! Slipstream is where we talk about the streaming services that help you get the content that you want. And uh, Hulu, as we mentioned last week, was rumored, went ahead and pulled the trigger and have named Mr. Mike Hopkins, the former president of distribution at Fox, as the new CEO of Hulu. Yeah, and uh, man, it's way too early for either of us to read anything into this at all. But as we talked before... Fox uh, was, I, I mean, am, am I wrong to even to even try to intuit the whole like Fox versus Disney internal struggle of, about ads versus closed? Because Fox was on the closed side. They wanted they wanted to yeah. have a walled garden in there. I don't know. It does seem like Fox got to put their guy in charge. Guy in charge of distribution, too, means that they figured they figured they're going to work with the local channels a bit. I, that that's the way I read this, but like, we we talked about it last week, so we'll just have to see. Uh, other yep. story we got from the LA Times is that both Netflix and Google Play, according to the Wall Street Journal, have been talking to the NFL about selling the Thursday football package. Uh, I I don't know the significance of the Thursday football package, but I think it's great well, that uh, the only thing about doing the Thursday the package things. is they have a Thursday football game. That a broadcaster shows now. And if if that were to come true, either Netflix or Google Play would be the place where you would watch the Thursday game. Although Netflix now, has said, be... we're not going to do live sports. So maybe this is yeah. more of an on-demand thing, like watch the game afterwards immediately on Netflix or something like that. Or some kind of like content related to the build-up to the game or the breakdown after the game. I mean, I know that uh, on the NFL Network, they have a, and obviously ESPN is made of supplemental uh, material uh, to each to, to the game itself. Because uh, Netflix has flat out said repeatedly that they don't want to do live. But who knows? I mean, there might be money and Google in, Play in live would, streaming. YouTube does live, but Google Play doesn't do live. So if they're talking to Google Play, which is what it said in the story, that seems like some kind of on-demand thing, some kind of highlights thing. And that's what N the NFL has really been pursuing, for instance, with the Xbox One, is saying, like, let's find greater ways to give people on-demand access to games. Right now, the, the Thursday games are on NFL Network, which is the yeah. NFL's own channel. I wouldn't think they'd give that up. I think they want have to have that as a centerpiece. Have you bought a lot of material through the Google Play Store? No. Okay, because I haven't either, but Google Play came up recently, and forgive me, just the 30-second side jag. Uh, I bought an album on Amazon, and it seems like I used to be able to buy stuff on Amazon and then download the files directly to manage. But this time, for the first time, it insisted that I had to either download its, its cloud player or its download manager, which really annoyed me for some reason. The fact that I could pay for a thing and, not, and have to install a program in order for the, for the privilege of downloading it. Uh, and somebody was saying, well, just switch to Google Play. But then somebody else pointed out that on Google Play, you only get one opportunity to download it, and then you're responsible for the file forever. And uh, whereas with the Google uh, or with the Amazon 
cloud ecosystem, you get a whole bunch of downloads, but you do have to deal with downloading it. So, so uh, on, and I know this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but, but, but does that convince you in either way? Like, which is the greater sin, having to download a program to get at the stuff that you bought or only being able to grab it once and being responsible for it forever? I would go voodoo and then you don't have to do either. What? Brilliant. All right. Except for they don't yeah. do music, but the point, yeah, whatever. Well, oh, you're talking about music. I don't know. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Um, yeah, okay. Google Play, yeah, you can pay for the Google Music thing, and then you can store it in the cloud, and then you know that. But you, th that's another cost on top of it. That, now yeah, we're talking maybe. about something totally not even related to video. I know. I'm all sorry. Right. That was me. <laughs> that's all right. Let's, uh, let's get into tube tops. This is about the devices you use to watch the stuff you want to watch. Samsung is coming out with a smart TV box because so many people loved the smart TV interface on Samsung televisions. They figured, hey, we can sell a box that just has the smart TV interface that people can use on any television and we'll charge twice what Roku does, $150. Okay. Right this moment, this looks on paper and in print and in our face like the dumbest thing they could possibly do. This is the reason you and I have gone back and forth before about whether we want our set-top box experience baked into the television. I don't largely because you know, it always turns out to be crap and then you're stuck with it for, you know, for seven years or so on. However... This is an opportunity. Now, nobody will buy this thing because nobody loves the, the Samsung set-top box experience or built-in uh, smart TV experience. Um, but now it's putting itself in that short revision cycle ecosystem where it's expected to have a new one every single year. This could be the way that they're taking all of their engineers and all of a sudden, instead of a seven-year development cycle, they're like, look, come out with a new box, make it better, make it faster, make it competitive with the Google boxes, with the, with the Roku's. Uh, and all of the others. And uh, this could be a very good thing for consumers in the long term, even though, yes, it's very easy for us to point and laugh at them right now. Yeah, and, uh, and, and to be fair, in both directions... Samsung updates the software on their smart TVs regularly. So it's not like once you buy the television, you're stuck with it the way it is the minute you get it. They, they do firmware updates all the time. They add channels, they remove channels, they add features, they remove features. Just like on a Roku box. If you buy a Roku, they update the software every once in a while, right? So it's not that different in that way. I think it would be smart, and I think you'd be absolutely right, Brian, if this box starts to diverge from what the smart TVs could do. If they say, let's put a little more hardware in there. Let's put some stuff in there that you can't do on a television because it's just too hard to build it in and keep the cost down. Then I think you might see Samsung have done something really smart. It may not be smart right now to sell this box if that's all they ever do, but this could be their entree into learning about this part of the business, the set-top box business. And I think you're absolutely right about that. Right on. TiVo has an update coming for the TiVo premiere, among other things, an updated Netflix app uh, that is supposed to be a lot easier to lose, uh, to use, sorry, along with <laughs> HD wish lists, a dynamic tuner allocation, and a bunch of bug fixes. So if you're a TiVo premiere user, go get the update. And I can't wait till I get some disposable income. I'm going to dive back into TiVo with a vengeance. Although the problem oh. is I just don't watch, you know, regular broadcast television. I almost forgot the big, big differentiator reason. for the Samsung Smart TV, uh, it, which TiVo has too, is a cable card. So you can Ew. use this to receive your cable television, which is a little bit different than you can't do that with a Roku. You can't do that with an Apple TV. On the other hand, it's not a DVR yet. So you kind of should still get a TiVo if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Shall we jump into the film film, sir? Yes, let's. Film Found is all about cool things that you might want to watch once you have your streaming service and your box. And one of those cool things you might want to watch is a documentary from Napoleon Dynamite producer Jeremy Kuhn and a feature film tracking the work of Chris Strompolis and Eric Zala. Now, the documentary and the feature film are both about the same thing. Uh, these two guys, over the course of their entire childhood, filmed a recreation of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, and this is shot for shot. They shot every single scene, and it's amazing because they shot everything in order in a row. So you actually watch them grow because this happened over years, or according to this, seven years later. You know, you see all the the principles age over time, and uh, then and, and the effects. Uh, some of them are like horrific. You realize when they're recreating the scene with the bar fight, and the, there's fires on all around. Like they're actually in a garage, actually lighting stuff on fire, and they're actually kids, and there's no. No 
adults around. So it's it's a remarkable story. And I and I thought there had been another documentary about them, but it wouldn't surprise me if this is the kind of thing. This story is so great, it wouldn't shock me if if we saw you know various iterations of it for years and years to come. Yeah, they started when they were eleven and twelve, and they finished when they were eighteen and nineteen. Uh, so this this actually got got shown at a film festival. And Steven Spielberg has has indicated his approval uh, of the idea. He, he hasn't signed anything though, and you'll need Lucas's approval as well. Uh, but it looks like it might actually happen. Also, oh, but it's such uh, a it's such a Hollywood story, though. I mean, the idea of starry eyed kids recreating their heroes' dreams, especially when the hero that they're wor- the heroes they're worshiping are now the moguls in charge of all of Hollywood. Tell me, this isn't going to just go through for sure. I don't know. I don't know, Brian. I don't know if I can approve it. Uh, that was my George Lucas. <laughs> it was good. Empire, speaking, it. Of, speaking of George Lucas, George Lucas made the movie Empire Strikes Back. He did not direct it. However, when they released it in Australia and Europe at the time, it was kind of de rigueur to give a short film. And so they gave a little bit of money to uh, Roger Christian. He was the guy who worked on the set for Star Wars. And wanted to make a 25-minute film to be the short film called Black Angel. It's legendary among hardcore Star Wars fans because the print was thought to have been destroyed. However, they found the print. They've restored it. They showed it at a Marin Film Festival. And now they're going to release it on Netflix and iTunes. It is astonishing to me how well this holds up. I mean, if you look at this footage from the trailer right now, and I'm, you know, digitally restored, sure, but it it looks so real, man. It's a window into Didn't the past, it, and this is what's me, great. It looks better than most films from that age, and I wonder if it's because they took so much care restoring it. Uh, well, I'm certain that had part of it to do, but keep in mind also that this is a period piece. It appears to be like medieval times. You got characters. I mean, it looks like if I told you this was a clip, from uh, uh, from Game of Thrones for about five seconds, you would believe me because it's and that's the great thing about period pieces is that there's nothing 1980s about right. this. It's, it just looks like, it yeah, exactly, man. It looks looks fantastic. That's that's part of why stuff like um, if you ever watch uh, the Lonesome Dove miniseries, it's aged fabulously well. I mean, outside of the fact that everyone has wonderful teeth, uh, everything about it you totally buy that it's in the you know late 1800s or whatever. And I believe they got 25,000 pounds from the royalties on Star Wars uh, allocated to them to make Black Angel to run before Empire Strikes Back. Oh, my Uh, gosh. Yeah. So slightly more than $50,000 at the time to make this movie. It's kind of crazy. Finally, uh, Nintendo has discussed a... Legend of Zelda movie and series producer Eji Onuma told Kotaku they really are serious about a theatrical experience for Legend of Zelda, but they would want it to be interactive. They would want people to like bring in their 3DS into the theater and that leads you into participating in it somehow, goes the quote from Onuma. Yeah, it seems like everybody's throwing around buzzwords and doesn't really know what they mean. You know, we saw this with the Disney interactive supplements oh, with to the, the Little Mermaid, mermaid yeah. experience. And it's like, that seems to me all it's going to do is be really, really annoying in the theater. And, and to be honest, even if this thing's a colossal failure, we need those to help us differentiate between what we love about video games and what we love about movies. So I applaud them for trying to explore if there is another branch in between the two. But my guess is, if I was going to lay money, is that this would land in the mushy middle and end up being a, a regrettable venture. But, uh, you know, but well, again, yeah, I, I mean, that's the trying. thing. These sorts of things, because no one's ever done them well, are going to sound that way until somebody does one well. Uh, well, and keep, keep that's in mind, tablet that's what computers it, history right there. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's also the iPhone because, you know, on the one hand, you had a phone. On the other hand, you had, you know, it's like outside of the alarm clock, there's been virtually no combination product that's been a success. And this is very much a combination product. Let's take movies, let's take video games and mash them up and money, money. It's like that virtually never works outside of when you create a new category like the uh, the clock radio and the iPhone. All right, grab your stopwatches, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for Scan Lines. Scan Lines. We scan the headlines and we give ourselves 60 seconds to talk about some other interesting stuff that we saw, starting with 
Netflix experimenting with DVD style extras. They would first apply them to their own original shows like House of Cards and Oranges of the New Black. But if that worked, they might give you some DVD extra type stuff in other partner content. This is huge if they're able to make it work. And first of all, I'm, I'm going to applaud it just for being on originals because I would go back. In fact, I started to rewatch or uh, not Orange is the New uh, House of Cards. And I wish that I wished that there was something extra I could get out of the experience. But instead, it was just sort of a refresh for me. Uh, eventually, though, I, I have to imagine that they're sort of burdened by the by the existing agreements and all that stuff. Right. That's they, they, they got a rental style agreement. And you can't just go off and throw all the extras in there without rejiggering that. And it sounds like Netflix wants to do something a little cooler than just DVD extras available with the click of a mouse. They, they want to integrate some stuff into the actual Netflix experience. So that could be cooler, too, I think. Yeah. And then I talked until the thing Yeah, we, we could just cut the, uh, cut the time. <laughs> uh, hey, Tom, if there's one yeah, thing Brian. I know about you... It's that you love Hulu Plus. I saw you and Hulu Plus sitting in a tree, uh, S-T-R-E-A-M-I-N-G. And uh, <laughs> Hulu Plus for iPhone ad supports for Google's Chromecast. Uh, yes, it's good that we see more players in this ecosystem. I think this is more of a win for uh, Chromecast than for Hulu Plus, though. What do you think? I was going to try to be really mad, but that was pretty pretty clever with the STR. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use that. Uh, no, I'm not a big fan of paying for Hulu Plus, as we all know. But Hulu Plus integration with Chromecast, I think everybody who does like Hulu Plus is going to be really excited about this. And the fact that it came to Android first annoyed some iPhone users who are used to having everything first. So this is, this is a significant step uh, for the yeah. Chromecast. Let's move on to Comscore saying, I'm referring to AOL by We're Number One. Of course, TechCrunch reporting this, and TechCrunch is owned by AOL. But what it means is that AOL had the most video ad impressions in September, according to Comcast. Not the this biggest video not. site. Number three in videos, but number one in video ad impressions, partly because they, they bought Adapt TV, which is a video ad seller. Yeah, and keep in mind also that that means um, if, if if your goal is – there's got to be some what a math happening in here because I would imagine that something like Google, which of course has you know YouTube, a destination that's all about video and gives you the oper uh, opportunity to skip ads. You know, whenever it does one of those, you can skip the ad in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. If you skip, it doesn't count as a view. Uh, I, whereas these are the guys who make sure that when you're in the middle of reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, there's some blaring ad for, for you know, prolapse uh, surgery in the corner. So go get surgery, jerks. Uh, many of the most pirated movies, Tom, aren't available yes. for legitimate online purchase. And that's why, shocker, they're pirated. Uh, for example, there's one study, this is a story on Washington Post, uh, Pacific Rim is only available for digital pur purchase. You can't stream it. You can't uh, digitally rent it. White House Down can't do any of the three. Elysium, you can't do any of the three. The Internship, you can only digitally purchase. You can't rent it or stream it. The Lone Ranger, you, can stream you can't stream it, but you can rent it and purchase it. And Shocker, they're like the top five. Uh, online movie availability as provided by Can I Stream It? Uh, dude, this, this is exactly what we've been saying, right? And it's one of those chicken and eggs things. Is, is it the popularity that makes it popular on, uh, on pirate sites? Or is it the fact that you can't get in any other way? Piracydata.org is the website if you want to investigate that very thing. Those numbers that we just gave are from last week, so they might have some refresh numbers if you go look there right now. They're trying to show that, hey, maybe the reason it's pirated is you can't get it anymore. Yep. Arios coming to Detroit on October 22nd. So, okay, Tigers fans, there's something to make you feel better. And... That is only what? That's the what the sixth city, the seventh city, uh, maybe the eighth city of the year. But they were saying they're going to have 22 cities by the end of 2013. I don't think they're going to make it. I think they could announce 22 cities, cities by the okay, end it's the of the 13th city. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, but if they're 13th, announced. I think they can. I think they can announce by. And in fact, it would actually be a blitz for them. Imagine we get to December and they're like, "We promised you 22 cities, nine cities," and they're like, you know, Odessa, Texas, Houston, yeah, they just named nine Texas. suburbs of New York. Yeah, yeah, there you go, <laughs> Hoboken. Uh, uh, which I, I, I think this is an important play for them. I think I think that that's what they need to do is become so big that it's harder to make a decision that declares their entire service invalid. Yeah. Absolutely. On to the next one. 
All right. Uh, the new startup Group Flix. Have you heard of this, Tom? I have heard of it because you put the link in the lineup. That's it. The yeah, first time this I came, heard this, of it was when you put it This in came there. to us from a fan over the email, by the way, fr at twit.tv. Uh, this, uh, the idea is, is that it's group flicks. You sign up, you say what shows you want. Because right now, uh, everything you sign up for, you, you have to buy, pay $3 per episode or whatever. And the idea is, is you would kind of crowdsource the enthusiasm for various shows and then they would make them available for streaming. So essentially they would come to, to essentially like get a bulk rate for streaming. Now, at, right now, everything that they, that they stream or do is available on other services as well. But they're hoping to be in a position where they have so many people subscribing to it and demanding certain things that they're able to negotiate brand new agreements. And I forget some of the uh, specifics. What were some of the, uh, the ones that they were going after that nobody had done before? Uh, I, well, Walking Dead, Magic City, Low Winter Sun are the three that are mentioned in the article. Yeah, nine dollars per month to stream those as much as you want. Uh, very, it's it's an interesting idea, kind of a sideways attack on it. And that, my friends, is scan lines. Time to move on to the winner movie draft. I'm playing an old version because the new yeah, version are. isn't here. Because 2012 was where I wish it was. See, this is this is Just the closest like, I'll get to winning is remembering 2012. That little wow. bumper was. The closest I'm going to get. What happened to 12 Years a Slave? $923,715? Like, I've never uh, seen anything. Actually, I've probably seen a couple. Two words, yeah. Tom. Limited release. That ah, okay. is the, uh, it's That's only it. out that in like five it. theaters right. right now. And of course, they're playing the Oscar buzz game. And we saw Lincoln do the same thing. Now, keep in mind, yep. Lincoln won it for me last year because he generated right. the Oscar buzz. And when it did uh, hit, you know, there was a giant resurgence. But look at those numbers. Third week in a row that Casey's rocking number one with Gravity. She pays $25 for this thing. She's on track. Million. That's okay, you Right? I mean, it's, it's, Jeff's in, in, in the second. Fall? Kanata's in second with $52 million for Captain Phillips, which that's about right. That may be yeah. slightly on the positive end of what I thought Captain Phillips would get, but it's not out of hand. I... I thought 100 million was the positive end of gravity. I don't think I did not think it was going to get above 150 by any stretch. It's 170. That that was a great catch. Good job, yep. Casey. This week, October 25th, we have Jackass presents Bad Grandpa. That's Justin Robert Young's movie, and The Counselor, Jeff Kanata. What do you think their chances are, Brian? I think Bad Grandpa is going to make all the dollars. In fact, I went to the Met yeah. with uh, Justin over Bad Grandpa and lost the, the game of chicken. I think that thing's going to be huge. I think that uh, you might roll your eyes at the jackass property. You might say that that name's not going to go. The fact is those the viral marketing is strong on it. It's a good idea. And uh, it's got Borat money written all over it. I think, I think it's going to do very, very well. Excellent. Let us see what we're watching. With our eyes. Let's talk about it. What we're watching? Uh, that's stupid. Let's see. Uh, let's let's see it. Uh, let's talk about it. In Bruges, you watched In Bruges yeah. finally because oh, cool. it just it just showed up on Netflix and nice. uh, the, the the movie itself. It, 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 I, I liked it. I liked it. It was good. Um, you know, it's and you could tell. You know, it's not not a four star for me, but there is one part that's a hundred percent four stars. You should watch it right now for Peter Dinklage being Dinklage as hell to quote Justin Robert Young. He is, yeah. he is as Dinklage as it ever gets. And what's funny is that movie, you know, it takes place in, uh, I don't know, we're, uh, in Belgium or whatever. And you got about, you got British. Irish actors and English actors. And, uh, but when they have the first Americans you see, like, I didn't even realize they were supposed to be Americans because they clearly had English accents, but then they called them Americans. I was like, wait, what? And I went back and respond, rewound it. And I realized that, oh, they're Americans because all three of them are fat and one has a Yankees hat. Now, despite the fact that they can't do American accents, okay. But then they get to Peter Dinklage, and I'm blown away. I'm like, man, that guy can really do an American accent. And then it hits me. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I go IMDb, and he's born in New Jersey. And I realize that my entire Peter Dinklage experiment has been <laughs> a lie. And he's really just American as hell. And now, like, Tyrion Lannister is the fake voice. And I felt betrayed all over again. Do you ever have that when... Somebody I don't feel betrayed. A... You're funny. I, I do get that shocking feeling, though, where it's like, what, that guy's Australian? His southern accent's incredible. Like, yeah, it's, it's it kind of turns your world upside down when you first see yeah. that interview where you're like, whoa, whoa, that's that. Yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, we talked on the phone about going to see Gravity, and I was not able to convince the wife 
to head out and see it again. Wait a minute, 3D. wait a minute, hold on. Peter, people are saying it's not Peter Dinklage in In Bruges. Are you telling me that Justin Robert Young led me, led, led me astray? That can't well, be true. Well, I don't true. know. If only we had the internet where we could look these things up and make sure that we're right. Uh, all right, well, here, I just typed in Peter Dinklage, and it auto-completed uh, In Bruges, and now I'm cl cl clicking Peter Dinklage on IMDb, and I'm typing... Uh, Amber, why why did it take me to this page if it's not? Who is yeah, that? He's not, he's not in it. Who is that then? That's well, hilarious. Uh, what's the character's this is, name? This is remarkable. I don't I don't freaking know the midget, the dwarf. Uh, that's amazing. If that's the case, the fact that everybody I knew, not Wait, one which person, which did you out. watch? Watch the one with Elizabeth Barrington and Ray Fiennes. No, right. I watched the one. I watched the one. I watched the one with uh, Colin Farrell, and Colin Farrell. Yeah, yeah. Ray Fiennes is in yeah. that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're talking about the same one. All right. And then Mark now Dom people are sending me. Oh Pretty man! Boy. Somebody called out Justin Robert Young, but he didn't correct it to me. Whoa! This is remarkable. Oh, that's amazing, dude. That's uh, uh, that's amazing. And then there's a whole conversation between, uh, as you can imagine, Ben Franklin and Jonathan Strickland saying, honest mistake, some friends of mine said the same thing a few weeks at, at back at a party. That's remarkable. And then Ben Franklin says, they all look the same to me. Stay classy, Ben Franklin. Uh, well, well, dude, if you want to see, uh, if you want to have my experience, go watch In Bruges. It's on Netflix right now. And you can enjoy the same experience I had. Uh, but you did see Gravity, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I don't know if we should save it for the spoiler zone or talk it out now. All right, let's do a spoiler zone about it. Okay. Uh, and what's 100 miles? I mean, I, I know it's a distance. Uh, oh, no. Okay, no. That's uh, I, uh, the reason I didn't see much else. And I, and I know I promised you I was going to watch The Walking Dead. But instead, uh, on Saturday, I rode my bike uh, over 100 miles in the hills oh. of West Texas. Okay, so that's a, you that saw was my experience. Or I did. Miles. I saw, I oh, saw trees. I saw dust. I saw hills. That's amazing. I watched uh, a lot of Doctor Who because my wife's trying to catch up before the 50th anniversary. And so that was all re-watching. It's kind of fun. Uh, I watched Haven. Still believe it to be one of the most underestimated uh, and uh, undervalued shows on television. I think it's. I think what they're doing this season keeps it really interesting. And I'm enjoying it. Watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I finally figured out what my problem with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is. Because I'm like, God, they have all the pieces. Like, I love Coulson, and I love the mythology, and it's shot well, and they're, like, actually on scene for these overseas, you know, they're in freaking Sweden, I think, uh, when they were shooting this last show. I don't like the the main new character storyline. I just think it's boring. It's not, it's not catching me. And so... I like the actor, and I even like the character, but it just seems so predictable. Like, here's the new girl who's kind of bad, and they don't know if they trust her, and she's not really that good at things yet, but hey, we're going to put her into a situation, and she's going to perform. And I feel like just, you could just, just, just write the whole thing yourself straight through. It's like through, you huh? need to do something with that character storyline that surprises me, like really honestly surprises me, and then that show will shine. It will sing. Uh, I, I really believe that that's the thing because I want to like the show. There's so many other things about the show that I really like. Yeah, it's, uh, Dead, Bonnie keeps asking me. Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Walking Dead episode two. Loved it. A lot of gore, right. but I love it. That's what I needed. I needed. I needed two in a row, and and now you're 100. percent I'm convinced. I'll I'll do it. I'll get caught up. All right, and then we can have Walking Dead uh, spoiler zones, which is really what America wants, Brian. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, if I if I, I could have sworn there was like a press release from AMC that said, look, we're only making the show so that Brian and Tom could talk about it. And we, yep. we decided to make it really good so that Brian will get back. We understand saw, we have a that PR Newswire. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, <laughs> PR Newswire. <laughs> they, they sent that because we're the only two guys to read that Newswire. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Last week, we opened the show with a knockdown drag out debate worthy of a presidential election about Netflix showing up on cable boxes, which we don't even know is true. But we decided to say, well, what if it is true? And we got some great feedback. About now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio. Yeah. Here it is, Tom. Aaron E. chiming in on the issue that is on the forefront of all of our minds. Hi, Tom and Brian. 
Several episodes ago, I recall some other listener had written in after either of you had mentioned difficulty in finding something really good to watch when you hit a lull. The listener had mentioned Babylon 5. I had written off Babylon 5 back when it came out in favor of Star Trek. Of course, I'm tricking you. Uh, This last week, I picked it up at the library. I'm one pilot, nine episodes in, and I was blown away by the quality of the storytelling for something that was made 20 years ago. It's an incredible show. If you haven't given it a shot, I will add my recommendation to your other listeners. I figured we had to have at least one feedback that wasn't about No way, Brian. I do not believe that Netflix and the cable companies should sit down and watch Babylon 5 together, and that will solve anything. I think you're insane. Wait. (laughs) That CNL really isn't about that issue, is it? <laughs> All right. Now, to the real answers. And keep in mind, when we actually had our discussion, even though, you know, we, we got fired up. I was a little fiery than you were. They were doing a straw poll as we were talking, and I was losing like three to one. Like, like vast majority was in favor of Tom. However, I was really shocked when we posted this in our Google our Google Plus pages and got a bunch of feedback and we looked at the feedback here, it was much closer to 50-50. I think probably still more people agree with Tom, but I was shocked at how many people said what I was trying to say much better than I did. Um, well, and feedback- honestly, to be, to be fair, I don't think either one of us is right or wrong. I think there are elements of each argument uh, that that probably are true. And I, I liked most the emails where people said that. Like, I agree with Tom about this, this, and this, but I can see Brian's point and agree with him about this, this, and that, because I think that gets us closer to actually what's going on. Right. For example, Tom Mark in Chicago, who says, Tom is right, that is all. Exactly, Mark. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, on the <laughs> other hand, we also got an email from Scott McMillan, who really very nuanced uh, writes, I agree with Brian. <laughs> All right, so there's a uh, there's uh, let's see. Michael says, "Hey Brian and Tom, great show and debate. Long time viewer, first time email. I think Netflix coming to the ca- to cable as an app, whether bundled or referral sign up, cable gets a kickback for new subscribers is good for consumers, especially those who never understood the whole Roku, Google TV, Apple TV concepts. Like Tom says, once folks realize they can watch the content on their crappy cable box." Uh, uh, not just on their crappy cable box interface, but also on smartphones and tablets away from the house. It starts planting the seed of cord cutting. It seems like it's also going to put pressure on HBO to try to break free of the broadcast here and maybe take that first step of high-speed internet HBO Go. However, we also got, uh, here, I'm going to move these so this goes in order, uh, an anonymous insider who says, first, let me say, I'm a contractor for a cable company very similar to Time Warner Cable, and I too would like to see the- Schmarmer Schmabel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're smarmer. I, I, too, would like to see the breakdown of cable industry as we know it, and I cut out the rest. And he says, I don't think all of the 67% of people that don't have Netflix don't know what it is. If you already have a computer, tablet, and or smartphone, then I'm pretty sure you know what Netflix is. So we have to know the percentage that has cable with no computer or smart device. The, those are the people that are going to be discovering Netflix, air quotes. I do not think it will lead to this group of people discovering Hulu or Amazon either. If they don't see commercials on cable or know what Netflix is, then they're not seeing the commercials on Hulu or Amazon either, whether uh, they have Netflix in their cable package or not. Yeah, I, I, I think he's right that a lot of people know what Netflix is. That's different than having used it. Uh, and having it available maybe with a free trial easily. Like, ah, I've got it on my smartphone, but I don't really want to watch movies on my phone. Suddenly it's on your cable box. More people, this is always the problem with these kinds of arguments, is everybody wants to phrase them as everybody and nobody, and it's always yeah. some kind of percentage. More people will now try Netflix if it's there easily and promoted on their cable box. Like, oh, yeah, I've heard about that Netflix thing. I'll give it a spin. Let me see. Oh, I get 30 days free. All right, let's, let's see what this is about. I think one thing that we got a lot of emails about that I, that is important is how is the billing handled? Is this going to yeah. be a, I'm going to sign up for Netflix, but it's billed through my cable company? Or is it simply the Netflix app shows up on the, the on the box like it is on a TiVo, and I still have to sign up through Netflix. It's just an app that's available for me on that cable device. And obviously that's probably one of the things they're talking about in these negotiations that are supposedly happening uh, is how that billing would get handled and who gets how much of it. Yeah, and uh, I, to be honest, I, I don't even know like who should fight for what. My gut says that Netflix should insist that they they remain outside of the system, but uh, I'm telling you, I mean, those cable companies could probably offer a very simple ease of acquisition for all of these customers and and get a slice of that with that fat pipe on cable. Uh, mm. I thought this was an interesting take. Corey writes us, hey guys, there's only one loser in this whole battle over Netflix jumping on the cable boxes, Roku. 
Having the availability mm-hmm. to watch Netflix on Netflix on all my TVs that have cable boxes is a lot cheaper than going out and buying a separate piece of hardware for each television in my house. And I think, Corey, that that's part of why my gut had me feeling like this was bad for cord cutters. Because if it's bad for Roku, and I mean very bad for Roku, I think that I think Roku should be really worried about this. Then it's hard for me to believe that it's good for cord cutters, as as I understand it in general. Well, one thing is the whole debate on like. How is it bad for cord cutters if they've already cut the cord? Who cares? Like how it doesn't affect them. It only affects people who haven't cut the cord. And that, we get into a whole like, is it a crusade to get people to cut the cord or not situation? Avoiding that, I think it is, it could be bad for Roku. In, unless Roku and Apple TV and and other box makers can can push the idea that, hey, you've got more independence. Sure, you've got a Netflix app on your cable device. But if you want to have Netflix and Hulu Plus and YouTube, and and I know Roku doesn't have YouTube right now, but but Apple TV does, I think that they can make a compelling argument of, hey, you know, you like that Netflix thing that you've got on your cable device? What if you could get all kinds of other cool stuff? And what I think is happening is we're coming into a world where the old divisions are no longer appropriate anymore. And it's a free-for-all where, hey, what if we get NFL available from Google Play or a Netflix or something like that, where there's one game a week where you have to have that streaming service. And maybe that streaming service isn't on your cable box. Maybe it's not Netflix and you have to go buy it. You know, like all bets are off. We are entering the melee zone where we, I don't think we have any idea who's going to win. The only thing we know is at the end of this, nothing is going to look the same. Yeah. Uh, a couple more feedbacks here. Uh, Kyle says, Brian, it's just an app. Shut your face. Love the show. <laughs> Very uh, helpful, Philip Kyle. Meadows, and I like this. Philip Meadows says, you guys were fighting on frame rate. And then the next <laughs> line says, how cool is that? <laughs> he says, uh, and I thought this was an interesting take. He says, Brian is a little more right than Tom here. Most people in Luddite America are not going to make the mental leap from Netflix on their cable box to Netflix on the actual internet. They're going to use it, uh, which benefits Netflix and cable, but not the cord cutters ideal. And uh, let's see, Aaron from Philly says, while you guys were passionately arguing your positions about Netflix on cable set-top boxes, I think you missed a big issue. If Netflix were to be integrated on these boxes, wouldn't the cable company have a decent amount of control over the interface and viewing experience? I would not put it past a behemoth like Comcast or Time Warner to screw with the quality or interface to hurt people's perceived experience with Netflix. To the few people who have not used Netflix before, this could truly tarnish their brand. I agree with Brian that Netflix has very little or nothing to gain from being on a cable set-top box, and it does help the cable companies, just my two cents. I thought that was a really good take. Well, I think that's silly. I mean, it's a red herring. Netflix, mm. if if they're actually a decent business, are not going to agree to a situation in which the brand is hurt by being on the set-top box, right? So, I, and I don't think Comcast is going to sneakily say, yes, we'll put Netflix and advertise them and spend a lot of money integrating them just so we can make you look bad to people. It just makes a certain sort of simple sense, but it's not the way business is usually done. I'm not saying it never happens or that it's impossible, but it's very unlikely. Uh, however... There could be an honest mistake. And that, that's where I think Aaron probably has a good point of, well, these devices aren't very good. And what if Netflix goes, well, I think we I think we got the interface looking pretty good. I think we got it good enough. Uh, and the cable company just can't actually implement it. And it's buggy. And it doesn't connect very well because of the key. Ca- you know what I mean? Like, it's not anything anyone planned for or foresaw or the cable company is trying to do it on purpose. It just, it just doesn't work very well. That could be bad for Netflix. So that's a, that's a fair thing to consider there. I just don't think it's a conspiracy. Uh- all right, since we have a little bit of extra time, I'm gonna, I got two uh, emails that kind of tried to act as a bridge between the two of us and explain what the other one was coming from. Uh, this one comes from Colin from Houston who says, Brian, uh, to, to me, uh, I obviously, in case you were wondering what I meant when I said, Brian, uh, I can't help but agree with Tom. Netflix has great recognition for its library depth and de- device uh, ubiquity and cord cutter world, but not necessarily in circles outside of it. By putting Netflix as an app on cable boxes, they could generate a swath of new users and new interest for the casual consumer. Consider when the first iPhone came out and it came with YouTube and Google Maps baked into it. There's no way that didn't help the casual users of the internet and internet services understand and be converted to use Using Google services, and when Apple eventually wanted to compete with Google with their own maps, Google was barely hurt from them removing the baked-in apps. Not only because they had them developed from the store already, but also because they could get their Google services when they wanted it, when they wanted it on whatever. Uh, Netflix is not going to be tied down by this deal, and this is nothing but good for Netflix. Tom, 
And by Tom, he means you, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> Brian oh. makes a good point, too. <laughs> Though the reasons for cutting the cord are to save money and gain control of watching the things when you want, Netflix is only a tool that can be used to cut the cord. I began my cord-cutting journey because I, like Brian, hate spending that $80 a month. For too long, I'd been sitting with Cable's tool belt, a clunky remote, and an ugly cable box. So I went out and created my own set of tools. Netflix, Chromecast, uh, Hulu, uh, Aereo, and Framerate. Uh, ooh, nice. I, I didn't realize he snuck that in there. Good job. Armed with these, I'll be cutting the cord on November 1st. By, by taking this tool, Netflix, and putting it on their own tool belt, the cable companies are lulling the consumer into complacency. The argument for cu cutting the cord is not you can't get Netflix on their set-top box. The argument for not cutting the cord is you can get net, uh, Netflix on your set-top box. Uh, by adding Netflix to the to cable boxes, the already long and arduous conversion uh, or conversation cord cutters will be having with cable companies will be getting longer, and the lazy consumers will continue to pay into the cable industrial complex. So I thought that uh, I thought that was really good on uh, for seeing both yeah, sides great. of the issue. Yeah, ni nicely nicely worded, Colin. Well well played, uh, and and just to kind of add what I've been thinking about this over the week. I think we had a lot of fun arguing this because I was a little surprised at Brian's t standpoint and he was a little surprised at mine. And, I, and we had a lot of fun hashing it out that way because we are both passionate about this. But in the end, I think both of us uh, misunder, not misunderstood. I think both of us, maybe even we intentionally, overemphasized the importance of Netflix in this equation. Uh, and yes. and in, in the end, what's going to change things are forces well beyond cable or Netflix's control. It's the fact that you guys want to watch what you want when you want. And maybe Netflix slows it down for a while. Maybe Brian's right. Or maybe it doesn't have any effect by going on a cable box. Maybe I'm right. Either way, it doesn't stop anything. It doesn't change anything because the overwhelming flood is that you're going to take control of your watching. And, and I really believe this. Nobody's going to stop that. They could put roadblocks in the way but eventually, all this complacency and stuff that people are arguing might happen if Netflix is on the box, even if it's true, won't last. Because people will say, oh, wait a minute. Why, I, 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 there's this other service now that has this other show that I want to watch. Or there's this original thing on, on Crackle that has become a huge hit. Maybe it's not Crackle, but you know what I mean? Like, you <laughs> yes, can't no, stop absolutely. the fact that the internet exists and is going to continue to put pressure on this old-fashioned way of doing things. What you're saying, Tom, is that you can't stop the signal, and that catchphrase yeah. has never failed to generate huge box office revenues for a property that was brought back from the dead. Uh, only one negative email out of the entire thing, Tom. We only got one truly negative email from Tim McMahon, who says, Gentlemen, I'm 13 minutes into episode 144, recorded Monday, October 14th. All I would like to say is, I don't like it when mommy and daddy <laughs> fight. <laughs> You know, it's funny. Is most of you did like it. Yeah, yeah so. most of you guys liked it a lot, which I thought was uh, was really interesting. And it's one of those things where it's like, um, you, you, uh, the only way we could get away with having a moment like that is that uh, it comes out of a, a world of deep respect for each other, and it's oh, it's yeah. novel. For, uh, forgive us because it's novel to find a point like this where we so diametrically thought we were opposed, and it was and fun really to explore. really believed in, in what our viewpoints are. I mean, you know, we yeah. were just faking it up for for firing line or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, stick around for the Gravity Spoiler Zone if you're so inclined. Otherwise, thanks for watching us. You can find us at twit.tv slash fr. You can email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. Don't forget, you can join us live. There's a chat room at irc.twit.tv, and you can watch us live on live.twit.tv on Mondays at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern-ish. Sometimes it, it changes around. And there's a YouTube channel. There's, there, you can subscribe to us on the YouTubes at youtube.com slash frame rate, right? Is that the right one? No. Uh, I think it might be Not a frame rate show. I think it's frame rate right. show. So don't go to subscribe <laughs> to frame rate. <laughs> frame rate show well, as maybe well. It's nope, that's frame not rate. it. Maybe Twitch we should put this there in the go. document so I'm not scrambling around trying to remember what Maybe it is. Maybe we should Twitch. actually learn where our show is. Twitch frame YouTube rate. YouTube.com slash Twit frame rate is where you want to go to subscribe on YouTube. We'll see you either in oh the my gosh. Zone or next I, week. That's even more comments I get to look at uh, calling me stupid. <laughs> and me fat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Oh!
As I mentioned on the show, I have seen Gravity, but not in 3D. And we had talked about me going seeing it again in 3D because Brian saw it in 3D. And now he's got his green screen cup up to his mouth. Yeah, in that's 3D. right. Is it, look, um, look at me. I'm uh, uh, I'm Sandra Bullock. It's I just hold my green screen cup behind my head and look at me. I'm Sandra B. I can't. <laughs> uh, all right. First of all, let's talk about the quality of the presentation. Um, it was good, right? We both agree. Yes, even in 2D, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, shot well, paced well, and gorgeous to look at, frankly. Absolutely. Uh, and what's funny is uh, keep in mind, like, like, like I took Bonnie and it was like halfway, maybe two thirds of the way through the movie because Bonnie doesn't follow all this stuff and she doesn't, she doesn't listen to frame, right? Uh, in fact, I, I wanted to say some code word right now to yeah. see if she would notice if she ever watched. But, but like, so it didn't occur to her until like two thirds of the way through the movie. She stopped and then she looks over and she's like, how much of this is computer generated? And I was like, virtually all of it. You're essentially watching a cartoon. And like, that was like, you know, brain yeah. explosion. Sandra Bullock and, and George Clooney and the other, the few other actors that are in it briefly are real. That's kind of it. I guess their suits, their, their space suits are real. Uh, and and since we're in the spoiler zone, we could say that the end scene appeared to be real. <laughs> How about that? The the final yes, scene of the movie, not the shot on location. Most <laughs> yes, of the movie exactly. not shot on location. Uh, this is well, the spoiler and, zone, so yes. Yeah, no, we, she, we could talk about it. Uh, okay, so so real quick, my first question is: as good as Children of Men or not? It's so well. It's not different. It's almost in some ways the same. I don't think it's quite as good. And maybe it's because I I saw it later. You know what I mean? But I it's, think I th it's a hard think choice the, for me. I, visually, I'll say it's superior. Like, yeah, like okay. as a I, visual I, treat, I it's, it's visually it's, it's big. Big. However, the scope of the story, I think, is smaller. You know, this is one person's journey. And that's yeah. the remarkable thing. Think about this, Tom. I you could see a whole galaxy of science fiction books being written about what happens on Earth when this this crap storm of trash essentially nukes like like there's no space there's no shooting up satellites there's no there's we're, we're shot back 40 years in the past for for the foreseeable future because of this cascade of space trash like oh, yeah. we can't right. go into space anymore there's huge sociological ramifications they ignore all of that and instead make it the very small very intimate story of a damaged woman who finds courage in herself to keep going that extra mile. I mean, that is remarkable to me. And I loved that they did the ballsy thing because from what I've heard, there was pressure like, oh yeah, let's cut down and show mission control and show them trying to save and show what's happening in the rest of the world or let's flash back to her kid or whatever. And Alfonso said no to all of that. Like just, you know, it's just this one story. Uh, I loved all of that and thought it was great. How about you? For all intents and purposes, this is a one woman show. Right. Yes. I mean, George Clooney's there to speak the George Clooney lines, but he wouldn't have to be strictly right. You could still have sure. her just kind of, you know, I imagining like Sandra Bullock on an empty stage with a folding chair. She could do gravity and just react Hit. to the things George says in a way that, you know what he said. I'm much happier that they did it this way. But then think about this. There are probably a dozen actors in this movie, two of which you see for a significant period of time. The others are almost ephemeral and, and with wow. barely any lines. Because they're just voices, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what was remarkable to me was I went into this movie fully expecting, because I had seen the trailer, right? The trailer, you, you see George Clooney, you see Sandra Bullock, you see w what happens with, you know, space trash destroying the shuttle. Uh, and then to me, I'm like, oh, the, it's obvious, like like if you're repairing the Hubble Space Telescope and your ride home gets trashed, this is a movie about two people who are definitely going to die and the entire movie will be 30, 90 minutes of them floating in black space, having intimate conversations, talking about their hopes and dreams and regrets and then slowly asphyxiating. That is without any doubt what I thought I was walking into with gravity. And as a result, it wasn't until two thirds of the way through the movie that it hit me, I'm like, Oh, I I think she, I think she might live. This this might be That's an so action funny. movie. I, I I don't know. Cause like, I, did you I, have that? I had no. I had the opposite. I'm like, cause when they 
for the same reason, when they show all that stuff in the trailer, I'm like, oh, that's what they're going to try and trick us into thinking they won't survive. And of course, they, it's Hollywood, so they will. Right now, even though it's Alfonso Cuaron, I know, but I'm like, they wouldn't be hitting me over the head so much if, if, if it was like that. Uh, so I was expecting them to live. I wasn't expecting George Clooney to die. Uh, when when really? when she finally lets him go, I was like, "Huh, okay." And that's when I started to doubt, like, maybe she won't make it. Maybe this is that kind of movie. So from uh, different they've, ends, they've we that both direction. came to that novel moment of honestly not knowing. Like that yeah. was a really awesome, rare treat to honestly not know how it, how it was going to turn out. And and the uh, the other interesting part was the the only spoilery parts for me. There were two. One was. We, we know this is a, a, a story of rebirth. Alfonso Cuaron says that in interviews. There's a part where she's floating in the International Space Station. She's had got her suit off, so she's just in her clothing that probably is her hot yoga pants. Yeah. yeah, but okay. And you see, you could see behind her one of the one of the tethers that that attaches something to something. It's just a hose, and it's perfectly placed to look like it's an umbilical cord. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. She's a fetus. Right. See, okay, now what's funny, okay. and, and we, we we spoke about this briefly, but like I didn't notice that umbilical, like I noticed the very intentional fetal position that she was in, but it's like that made sense to me. I'm like, yeah, I would adopt that position too if, if I was in that situation. And I understand they're trying to make her feel warm and in the womb for this brief moment. I did not notice the the umbilical cord placement. And I when you told me that you saw it and you were bummed, I likened it to you having the bad angle on a magic trick. Like, because you saw that, you didn't have the magic of just really having this vague yeah. feeling and not knowing why. Like, you saw the card move when you weren't supposed to, uh, which is exactly what happened to me on Superman. You know, I saw all the 9-11 imagery, and once I noticed it, I noticed the ash, I noticed the cloud, I noticed the scaffolding, and uh, uh, and and that reduced that power to me. Uh, man, oh, there was, other, there was something else I wanted to say as well. Oh, uh, this totally replaces Avatar as my go-to explanation for justifying 3D in the movie theaters. Avatar, I thought, was a transformative experience that uh, that really played to the medium very well, and I liked it a lot. I wouldn't recommend you watch Avatar without the 3D, except for now, I guess, if you're going to see it at all, I guess watch it in 2D. But this is, it, it alone justifies the 3D. I was lost in the moment. I was sucked all the way in. I believed everything I felt there. It was extraordinary. I thought it was great. The uh, I mentioned there were two parts that took me out of it. The other part that it didn't really take me out of it so much, uh, but when she's in the Chinese capsule, is it is it the Chinese? No, she's in the Soyuz yep. on her way yep. to the Chinese capsule, and she gives up right, and she just she turns everything off, and then all of a sudden you get a knocking at the door, and it's Clooney, right? I was like, yeah. for a split second, I was like, really, they're gonna let him live? Like I, I don't quite believe that, and then I thought, well, maybe it's maybe it's the Chinese people saw her and are coming out to retrieve her, and then as That's soon as he opens first. the door and it decompresses, and she lives by just kind of shielding her face. I'm like, oh, it's a hallucination. Okay, got it. Yeah. Well, and I think I think they played it perfectly in that regard because I think different people had the dawning realization that it was a hallucination at different moments. You know, for me, it was like I was like I I, I didn't give them enough credit, and I was like. Are you really gonna pull this? This is quite a tonal shift for you. And it wasn't until he pulled out the vodka that I was like, okay, this is so obviously, clearly, you know, a fantasy over the top. It's got, it's got to be. And of course, it was. Uh, I thought they did that about as good as they could. And yes, there was a moment of disconnect. And I, and I bet most of the audience, whether you had that disconnect immediately by his appearance or the disconnect uh, at the end by his disappearance, uh, regardless, I think everyone had that same kind of of experience. Now, there is one thing. I want to really harp on with this movie and All I'm right. truly pissed off about it. Uh, and that is every freaking scientist out there who feels like they need to get on their stupid high horse <laughs> and criticize what gravity got wrong. And it's like, I want to, I want to physically throw mashed potatoes in the face of Neil deGrasse Tyson. No, and, no, no, and no, no. you Phil plate. Look, no movie in the history of Hollywood ever ever in all of history has worked harder to try to get the science as realistic as possible to make it believable, but also bother to tell a movie that will appeal to the masses. And it's like, people are, people are on my junk about like, well, uh, 
is just so wrong because if you want to get to the Soyuz, if you're going to direct the Soyuz to the Chinese station, you wouldn't point it and thrust at the station. You would point down so you get the angular velocity. Shut up, all of you. Shut up. You're the problem. You're the problem. We can't have nice movies. We live in a world where you have to explain in the opening title card that in space, there's no air, so it has to be silent. That is the masses that you're dealing with. And these guys did an extraordinary job of taking real science and making it compelling. And it's not for you to nitpick on the cracks. Yes, we're in the uncanny valley of scientific movie making. You're so close to having everything right that you just notice those flaws. Shut up. Shut your stupid science mouth. I don't want to hear about the flaws. They did you a favor, and you should thank them. I'm done. I can't wait to get the email uh, explaining what movie got more science right than Gravity now. That's my first reaction because uh, I'm sure maybe, we're going to get that. Maybe Moon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. But as soon as you said no movie is ever, I'm like, oh, there they go. It's emails. <laughs> IMDb. Uh <laughs> I also, and I know you know this, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has actually been over backwards. I don't know if Phil has to, but I'm sure he has, to say, like, I liked the movie. I was just, <laughs> I'm a scientist. It's what I do. I'm like, oh, well, you know, what's interesting is, like, these satellites are not all in the same, you know, orbital plane. So you wouldn't be able to go straight from one to the other. And the meteor storm wouldn't take them out that way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, yes, the the reaction of of much of the Internet has been to take his statements and run with them as a condemnation of the movie and the reaction of the other part of the internet has been the one we just witnessed here on the spoiler zone of of indignation that that they're being used as weapons against the movie i thought the neil degrasse tyson stuff because i saw gravity in the theater and as soon as i got out of the theater he had just finished like his first round of tweets about it so i looked at them right away and i was like oh really that's all like that's not bad you know like yeah. okay so they moved moved everything in the same plane for the sake of the story I, I can deal with that. I can live with that. The only one that really bothered me a little bit was if she had, because of the the momentum with uh, with with Clooney, she really would have just needed to tug on his line, and he would have come towards her. And that's a pretty important point in the story. Well, that, no, like, no, but but she uh, couldn't the, do anything to stop him. And but the vibe, Tyson was saying like, well, you could change that momentum actually. But but in that moment, it looked like the uh, the ribbon around her foot was slipping away at a fixed rate based on the amount of momentum being pulled against it. So if she had tugged, it just would have slipped it off of her. Was was the way I read that moment? Was was well? I think what uh, what he was saying is that that you could have changed his momentum without risking hers. Hmm. And it, and, right. and brought it back. Um, I, I maybe I may be misreading it too. Uh, but that that sounded like there was a way out of that situation that wouldn't have killed Clooney with physics. Mm. So I, ha I have to wriggle a little to let my, you know, suspend my disbelief on that. And only because so much of the rest of the movie relies on proper angular momentum. It's impressive. Yeah. How respectful yeah. they are of that in most cases. So, yeah, they don't point down to get, to, you know, that bothers me a little less that they didn't do that sort of thing. But again, they're so it, it only really sticks out because everything else is so right. Usually, you don't pay attention to that stuff at all because you're like, eh, it's movie physics, right? Things, things work yeah. differently in space. Well, and it's great that they're getting these criticisms, right? And that we're reaching an age where you can even get away with this level of scientific literacy, you know? Uh, oh, man, that brings up the other thing. I thought the biggest achievement for me in this whole thing was the sound design. Uh, I thought, you know, the 3D was extraordinary, but you expected the, the visuals to be amazing. But the sound design was extraordinary, the way they were able to, when you were outside of the helmet, you heard uh, transmissions and, and things that were clanging, things you would hear if you had a hand on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, then when it went inside, you heard the breathing, you heard inside the ISS, you heard the heartbeat. Uh, it was very internal, and I thought it was very subtle, the way they used those effects. Uh, the soundtrack, I thought, was less subtle. The, the the score was a bit over present for my taste, but uh, but I thought the the sound effects design was was fantastic. Yeah, and and I mean just the fact that they let it be silent, right? That's that's amazing, right there. Uh, you, yeah, you have to. I I was impressed with that, and I was a little impressed with that with Battlestar Galactica. But they cheated sometimes. I'm pretty sure this movie, sound design wise, never cheated on what you would actually hear at any well, given and moment. And they uh, 
you could make a case like some of the things you would only hear if you had a hand on the object near it, you know, where where the stuff was colliding. Uh, but but again, that's that's so tiny. I don't want to. I don't want even. I don't want to get all Neil deGrasse Tyson on you. <laughs> yeah, and and there's a great story on the Verge about how Neil deGrasse Tyson actually posted a bunch of things he loved about the movie and and science things, and and he said he really did. He he did enjoy the movie a lot. So would have been okay get- for him to just say the things he loved. He didn't need to. He, what? What's no, wrong with saying no, what's great? Oh yeah, let's never it, criticize anything. Let's only say nice I'm facts. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. When you make a career out of crusading for a movie to get science right, and then and and a, then a movie gets 99 percent of the way there, maybe maybe that's not the movie you want to nitpick the one percent on. That's that's all. No, I'm saying. I'm saying that is the movie you should nitpick the one percent on to show just how much it got right. Otherwise, people are going to go, oh, so you're covering up the facts that it didn't get right. No, this is exactly the right way to go and say, like, this is science. In science, we don't make value judgments. We say these are the things that are right. These are the things that are wrong with a certain level of confidence. I I think Neil deGrasse Tyson was just being good. Hmm. Frame rate show at gmail.com. I don't think you can uh, do, I don't think you shape the truth just to fit what you would like to happen. That's, is that's this, what for propagandists. That's not for scientists. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Well, all right. That's, uh, that's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let See? the dog chime in on that. <laughs> I'm not even going to start talking. Otherwise, it's going to descend into something else. Uh, okay, hey, man. Here's the, here's the post about Clooney. When Clooney releases Bullock's tether, he drifts away. In zero G, a single tug brings them together. So it doesn't, you're, you're right about bringing them, uh, bringing them together. Uh, but maybe that, that still would have doomed her. But that's what he says. Uh, when Clooney releases yeah. Bullock's tether, he drifts away. In zero G, a single tug brings them together. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, and they did represent it as though he was continuing to have uh, acceleration away from her, which that that wouldn't happen. But whatever, man. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to get drawn into your thing. Uh, hey, uh, are you going to say? I'm, I'll say this. Go see Gravity in 3D in the theater right now, while it is still the epitome of the best technology for 3D and the best storytelling we've seen in 3D and the, the most amazing visuals we've seen in 3D because uh, it won't be the same when you watch it on the small screen. It certainly won't be the same even if you watch it in 3D on the small screen. Go do it right now. Don't make an excuse. Don't miss it. I would add to that that 100% going to back Brian on that, but I haven't seen it in 3D and having seen it in 2D because all the 3D versions, they have assigned seating at the theater where we're at, and all the 3D versions only had really crappy seats. So we decided to watch it in 2D with better seats and didn't didn't feel bad about that decision at all. It's gorgeous in 2D. I can't imagine it wouldn't be even more gorgeous in 3D, and I've got Brian's opinion to back that up. So if you can't see it in 3D for any reason, don't not see it. Go see yeah, it. Just it's at least, at least see it on the big screen for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That done is it done. Spoiler Zone, right? Yes, sir. Good times. I'll uh, get caught up on The Walking Dead. I'll catch you uh, next week. Stand down on the spoilers, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next time.